Hello and welcome to Procrastination Points. For those of you coming here for the first time, I read books and offer up my commentary about what went wrong. I don't have a lot of reasons for wanting to do this book other than I couldn't remember the last time or if I ever had snarked a sci-fi book. It took me a long time to find something that I felt would be worthy of a snark, but then I remembered that young adult sci-fi is a thing and here we are. Anyway, let's get to it, shall we? Alienated by Melissa Landers, Chapter 1. The story opens on Cara Sweeney, who is determined to win a Fulbright scholarship to a university. She does this by hyper-focusing to make sure that she's valedictorian of her school. However, she's more than a little disappointed to realize that the only scholarship that she's won is for something called the... Okay, help. I wanted aliens, but I failed to acknowledge that I was going to have to pronounce the weird alien words that the author came up with. I always feel a little bad when it's clearly some foreign word that I'm butchering, but with stuff like this, and then the author never gives us any sort of pronunciation guides, can we not with making fantasy or sci-fi names, but then not give the pronunciations? She's won a scholarship for something called the Lahirs. This makes Kara uneasy because while she was open for the possibility of doing a school exchange, she wasn't ready to go so far away. However, as the story continues, we learn that this isn't some satellite nation that broke away from a country in Europe or whatever. No, these are literally aliens from space. But their secretive nature made her stomach feel heavy, like she'd eaten a dozen Taco Bell double-decker burritos in one sitting. Oh lord, I hope that this isn't a preview of how the rest of the book is going to go. The principal goes on to tell Kara a little about the young man who will be living with Kara's family while Kara is in space. He just turned 18. His name's Alix. He pronounced it like Alix. Why does this character get a name pronunciation but not the species of the people Kara is going to be living with? Is this because Alix is going to be the main character or something? Kara gave the footer a perfunctory glance and handed it back. Whatever. They all looked the same to her. Casual racism! Lord, I can't wait until the actual racism gets started. Not. Kara is desperate not to go, but rather than to flat out refuse the author, she says that she's not sure how her parents would feel. Like, sweetie, it's okay to turn down something like that. Even if it's an amazing opportunity, it's okay to say no. But the principal eagerly says that he talked to her parents before talking to her, and they're likely eagerly getting a room ready to host the exchange student. Carr is even more startled when he goes on and says that Carr's older brother, Troy, will be going up now and spend the next year in some sort of ambassador program. Carr will go up next year, and Troy will be there to guide her. Also, Troy is a Marine who spent two years fighting in the Middle East. I'm so happy to hear that we might have had contact from aliens, but humanity is still unable to put aside our differences and stop throwing bombs at one another. The principal leaves so that Kara can talk about details with the random soldier also in the room, but as he leaves, Kara starts to randomly disassociate and weighs the pros and cons. In giving up a year of her life, she's basically be able to go to literally any school. She had all but given up on her dream after her mom got sick and the cost of care put them deep in the red. Also worth noting that the aliens showed up but Americans still couldn't get their broken medical care system together. And yes, she would have to share space with this e Alix, but Kara is hoping that she could get some insider info about the aliens and maybe even get a book deal. And the longer she thinks about this, the more she decides that the inconvenience of living in space for a year would be worth it for her future. Colonel Rudder then starts to explain some things to Kara. He talks about something called the Lahir Exchange Ambassador Program, or LEAP, and that America, France, and China are all part of this. Apparently, forget the UK or literally any other established nation, I guess. He tells Kara to quit her weekend job as a waitress and that being a LEAP is going to be her full-time job from here on out. They'll pay her, so I guess that's okay. He talks about how a lot of Americans aren't exactly on board with the entire alien thing, but the thing that baffles me is, do you really want for one teenage girl to be the one to convince people. I've read enough young adult novels to tell you that the teenage protagonists in books never make good decisions. Never. I don't care that Kara is the valedictorian. At some point, her intelligence will be tossed out the window because she wants to make kissy face with Alix. Tell me I'm wrong. Besides, she wouldn't exactly miss slinging footlongs at the dreamy weenie. I'll give my two weeks notice after school. Make it one week. Friendly reminder that giving two weeks notice is a courtesy. She literally sells hot dogs. I don't think anybody is going to care.
Red Ark goes on to say that they'll also be doing televised interviews every Wednesday. Also, when Alex is there, Kara will have to help him collect various samples of stuff like soil, water, and air so that his people can study them. Red Ark says that she's going to New York for a leap gala in a week and then leaves. The principal gives her permission slip she'll need to return first thing in the morning. Less than five minutes ago, her greatest dilemma had been which movie to see Saturday night with her boyfriend Eric, and now, oh no, Eric, she'd forgotten all about him. He and his friends hated Lahir's, not just a pinch of ignorance and a dash of mistrust, but serious loathing. He'd go full on banana sandwich when she told him. And there we are. I was wondering when the full on racism was going to start. As Kara leaves the office, she thinks that when the aliens showed up, they introduced the medicine that cured her mother's cancer, so she finds it difficult to hate them so much when they saved her mother's life. Their narration then jumps over to Alex. Why the elders had chosen to send them away and to a primitive foul planet such as Earth was beyond him. Seems like there's going to be casual racism on both sides. Joy. Anyway, so it seems as though Alex and some of his friends are up to no good and are smuggling some sort of drug down to Earth. He talks with one of the elders and thinks that he could literally be executed for his treachery. Also, these aliens can apparently communicate telepathically. Neat. Mankind didn't regulate their population growth as Lahirs had done. Alex had studied human history. He knew what would happen if those aliens ever settled on his planet, something American humans called Manifest Destiny. They'd take whatever suited them and outnumber the Lahirs within decades. He couldn't let that happen. Mm, yeah. Nope. Nope, I'm already on Team Alien. He's right. A Americans don't have a good track record with first contact. One of Alex's friends gives him a necklace and has to explain the concept of how humans wear jewelry. Alex mocks the idea of wearing a rock found on the ground, but the others are quick to assure him that the humans will love it. Earth girls really covet stones from the ground, Cyrene asks in disbelief. My human's a male. I wonder if he'd enjoy a nice satchel of dirt. Or her, perhaps a parcel of animal droppings, Iran added with humor in his eyes. What odd beings. I'm gonna leave this right here. Anyway, one of Alex's female friends takes off. Seems as though she's been having boy drama. The narration keeps throwing out all these alien concepts to us and doesn't stop to explain most of them. I know that the book probably will get around to them, but it's kind of frustrating when books do this. Chapter 2 The next chapter opens like the introductory video on a vlog. Yes, it's every bit as cringe-inducing as you might expect. Like, I'm all for making stories relevant, but this ain't it. Anyway, Kara is intent on making her blog or vlog or whatever in order to cash in on this exchange program. Kara scheduled her post to drop at 6 o'clock the next morning, which gave her more than enough time to spring the news on her boyfriend. Since she hadn't considered Eric and her decision to accept the scholarship, the least she could do was give him a head start and blowing a gasket. At this point, I think that it goes without saying that Eric is going to be kicked to the curb at some point or another. But at the same time, girl, what are you even doing? Now, we haven't even been introduced to Eric on the page, but literally the only thing the narration has told us about him is the fact that he's an alien racist. It kind of makes me wonder what kind of person that Eric is outside of his bigotry and what's wrong with Kara to the point where she's in a romantic relationship with him. Anyway, Kara closes her laptop and decides to rejoin the debate team as they practice for the next debate. Kara shoots a rubber band at the guy speaking and tears him a new one for his lack of confidence. Josh licked his lips and nodded, then began yammering with all the confidence of a deer standing down a speeding Mack truck. Oh boy, we are in full of foral series of this, aren't we? But the entire scene with Kara focusing on personal projects instead of her club activity and then being really unnecessarily mean to one of her fellow club members really hammers into my mind that she's simply not a nice person at all. But since she is the main character and the idea of this book is the aliens, I'm willing to give the author the benefit of the doubt and wait for the impressive character growth. Fingers crossed, but not holding my breath. Kara thinks about how Alex had requested that his room be gray with no embellishments or decorations to it whatsoever. Even though Kara isn't thrilled with the idea, she's hoping that making her alien guest comfortable will loosen his tongue. Then we finally get an on-page introduction to Eric after Kara gets home. I'm uh, going to try and make this so that it gets by YouTube censorship rules, but... Female chest area and snacks. Kara folded her arms while a smile and tugged the corners of her mouth. Is that all you want from me? She was only half joking. Ever since junior prom, when a few of Eric's buddies had gotten lucky, he'd been trying to play catch up like fun times was a race and he didn't want to come in last place. He didn't seem to care that she wasn't ready to cross the finish line. 
Oh boy, yet another controlling jerkwad of a boyfriend who is only being introduced to make a Alex look better in comparison. I might have been half joking earlier when I asked why Kara was with him, but now I'm asking with 100% seriousness. And then they walk inside and find Kara's parents making out against the fridge. As you can imagine, both teens are like, gross, get a room. However, as her parents pull apart, Kara takes a moment to make sure that her mom still looks healthy, like the return of ovarian cancer would somehow announce itself on her face or something. Eric had left the kitchen when they'd walked in on Kara's parents and openly and loudly complains when she joins him in the living room with no food. I am once again asking what Kara sees in him, because I feel like him demanding food and happy times from his girlfriend reeks of misogyny. Eric wants to go upstairs if you follow my drift, but Kara says that her friend Tori is coming over. Eric is annoyed over the entire thing and demands to know why that clinger can't get a life of her own. Trying to get rid of me? Maybe I should. Heat rose into Kara's cheeks, the endless groping, the insults. She couldn't take much more of the new and improved Eric. Why are you with him when it's obvious you don't even like him that much? Kara then tells Eric that she's during leap, and Eric loses it and gets even angrier when he finds out that the exchange student saying with Kara is going to be a boy. Tori comes in, and uh, I honestly don't know what I was expecting at this point. She was the yin to Kara's yang, teak wood skin, jet black eyes. I know people get angry and upset whenever people compare things to food, but honestly, is wood somehow better? Anyway, Tori and Eric don't get along, so I'm obviously a big fan of Tori. Tori then pulls a piece of paper out from her bra, gross, and both she and Eric say that people were handing them out all over town. Halo, Humans Against Lahir Occupation. Uh, author loves her acronyms, doesn't she? Kara asks if they're serious and establishes to the readers that Halo is a well-known terrorist group that is known for stockpiling weapons and spouting doomsday prophecies. She goes after Eric for swallowing Halo's nonsense, but Eric chews her out for willingly siding with the aliens. He encourages her to read the pamphlet, except that being the captain of the debate team, Kara finds Halo's arguments laughable and immature. Even Tori is on Eric's side about not winding the aliens around her, which on top of being a racist, it also makes Tori look like a really terrible friend for wanting to ditch Kara the first time the going gets tough. This could make my whole career. No, just like that? God, you're so selfish, Eric was shouting at her for the first time in all those years they'd known each other. Putting yourself in the whole town at risk and why? So you don't have to take out student loans? Selfish? Selfish? He has the actual audacity to call Kara selfish for wanting to make money and to not be up to her eyeballs in debt for a college degree. He literally told her not even two pages earlier that he didn't want to be with her if she dared to bring the alien exchange student around. Talk about self-absorbed. Before this can go any further, Kara's dad shows up. I don't know if he simply doesn't like Eric or if he heard any of that, but he pointedly asks Eric and Tori if they have homework as a nice way of telling them to get out from his house. They leave, but Eric makes one last thought in Kara's ear before he goes. And Tori was crazy to think the Lahiris wanted to lure her to their planet and trap her there to make babies. If that was their goal, why not abduct her now? If that's all she's worried about, then I should probably remind her that there are humans on Earth, probably local to where she lives, who think that the only thing women are good for is being barefoot and pregnant. She should probably be more outraged over actual threats to women than something that was made up simply for shock value. Thankfully, Kara realizes how absurd Tori's thoughts are, but her real concern is the danger being one of the alien hosts is going to be. Chapter 3 we jump to the aliens having arrived on Earth to the Leap Gala mentioned in the first chapter. Alex hasn't been introduced to his host family yet, but he knows who they are by sight alone, so he watches them and silently judges them. Was this girl truly the best the humans had to offer? I keep asking why in the world they would leave the future of alien communication up to a handful of high school students, because it's not simply Kara who is doing this. He does think that Kara is kind of pretty in an alien sort of way, but thinks that with her ginger hair and blue eyes, she's kind of... Right. Apparently, these things aren't natural on their own planet. He looks across the way and sees Cyrene with her Earth host, who is trying and failing to put the moves on her. Cyrene comes over to where Alex is and mentally complains about how disgusting that the man is. As they watch, the man turns his attention to the nearest female and starts to flirt with her next. Apparently, manners are not included when nominating people for the program. Imagine blowing intergalactic relations because a French teenager couldn't read body language. 
quickly look at the other alien's host who is from China. This brings a narration to talk about China's famous one-child policy and how the host seems to have a young child with them, and Alex laments over why the other countries can't do the same. With their limited resources, humans were mating themselves into extinction. Okay, okay, we get it. Enough with the heavy-handed lectures already. Alex and Cyrene talk about how they likely won't be on the planet for long, possibly only a month. They talk about how if they get caught, then they'll die. I'm not sure that the narration has made me care much about what happens to them either way, but all I know is that I'm getting bored while the author fasts about setting up this big mystery. There's building suspense, and then there's going so slow to build it up that people lose interest in anything that you're doing. We jump over to Kara, who is mainly complaining that in order to avoid having to buy a new dress, her mother had gotten her spanks, but they were too small, and she's been in literal physical pain the entire time. Her brother comes over and chides her for not acting more sad about how he's going to be leaving for an entire year. She's torn between missing the familiar comfort of her brother and chewing him out for setting up to leave the family all over again. They look over to where some of the older aliens are standing along with two of the three alien exchange students. They comment that the aliens had been standing there, not moving, and not saying anything for a long time. Kurt wants to go over to find out which one her family will be hosting, but she's too intimidated by them to go over. All of them, men and women alike, wore their shoulder-length light brown hair tied neatly behind the neck. It blended perfectly with their russet skin, and when combined with the tan uniform, they were a monochromatic solid wall of brown, like walking paper bags. And then the narration jumps back to Kara's personal problems. She tried to cough, and the elastic band digging into her waist practically spliced her liver in half. Ow, what's with you? Troy ran a hand over his crap black hair and quick croaked an eyebrow. Female problems? He whispered female like it was a dirty word. I guess we can add in things like misogyny to the list of problems this book has. Troy encourages his sister to go take her overtight underwear off and Car is talked into it. However, before she can go in, a member of the Secret Service stops her to say that the President of the United States is powdering her nose and apparently not one single other female in the gala can use a toilet at that time. But it made sense that a President who didn't care about the Constitution didn't care how long she monopolized the ladies' room either. Can't wait to get into that some more. Hopefully that won't be brushed under the rug in favor of teenage makeouts. Kara tries to ask the Secret Service where she could find another restroom, but the guy is tight-lipped and apparently doesn't care. So Kara decides to duck into an alcove to take her underwear off. However, as you might imagine, somebody catches her doing this. And if you've been around the channel a while, you might remember that a similar scene happened at the start of Breach, where Nate caught Lila taking off some ripped pantyhose in her car. So honestly, Kara being caught like that is kind of setting the tone for how I'm expecting the rest of this series to play out. As I'm sure everybody predicted, the person who interrupted her was one of the aliens. Kerr is startled at how handsome that he is up close. She awkwardly offers up an excuse before getting out of there as quickly as possible. Kerr is naturally embarrassed as anything, but she thinks that she's botched the introduction to the alien she's supposed to be bunking with. She also feels like any chance of convincing Eric to be on her side flew at the window because Alex is too hot. Oh, I swear to the gods that if there's an urinating match between Eric and Elix over who gets to be with her, I'm going to chuck my computer into the sun. Karen goes back to her brother who says that he has to go onto the ship to leave now, so he says goodbye before turning around with another word. Kara is kind of upset over the entire thing, but thinks that it's perfectly in character for Troy. Kara then goes over to her parents where they're officially introduced to Alex, and it was indeed Alex who had accidentally seen her taking her underwear off, much to Kara's continued mortification. Kara's mom pulls Alex into a hug, which makes the alien seem uncomfortable. Finally, he turned to Kara. She offered her hand and he took it in both of his. While his grasp was warm and strong, there was an eerie vacancy in his gaze, almost robotic. She hadn't noticed it before, and the last line of Hela's pamphlet suddenly rang in her ears. He may look human, but he is not. Some long-buried primal instinct screamed, Danger! But she tightened her grip and resisted the urge to pull her hand free. Kara, he began. His voice was alluring, then his eyes were dead. Your name is the Irish word for friend. I hope you and I will be great friends. It sounded rehearsed and completely insincere, almost backhanded in its delivery. Since he'd done his research into her name, she did her own too. She says that his name means son of Elix, which seems to surprise him. Kara only thinks about how awkward that it is and how it's going to be a long year.
Thanks for listening to my book snack on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. And if you've already read all of my main snarks, then you can find even more snark on my Patreon. You can access it for $1 a month. Members also get early access to my main Tumblr snark. Special thanks to Dawn, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well, just one cent per word. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of erotic short stories and now two full-length novels. I also sometimes run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering more things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!